Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, the topic I'm going to be presenting today is visual agnosia, particularly the visual associative agnosias. Most people who are familiar with the neuropsychology of semantics are going to have heard about semantic dementia, which is the condition in which you've got selective atrophy of the temporal lobes, resulting in a global loss of meaning representations. I most definitely am not going to be talking about semantic dementia today. I'm going to be talking about another condition, the agnosias, in which we get a breakdown of meaning, resulting, in fact, from focal lesions more posteriorly in cortex. And the critical thing is it's affecting visual cognition rather than semantic representations via other domains. That will come clear, I hope, as I mentioned it, but I just thought I'd put scare quotes up for anyone who's expecting to hear about semantic dementia today. That is not what I'm talking about. Now, the um, agnosias, the term agnosia, as many of you may know, is actually coined by Sigmund Freud, a nice synthesis of two Greek words um, to mean uh, without knowledge, um, agnosis. Um, and the first patient who qualified as being described as, a, as an agnosic was a patient uh, who was uh, described by Lissa back in 1888. He'd been um, out walking and a fence had blown on top of him, giving him a head injury. Um, and afterwards, he had impaired visual recognition. Um, there's a description, there's a translation of the paper um, in cognitive neuropsychology. And this is just sort of a lift from that. He, uh, Gottlieb could give a good account of everything around him, but was quite incapable of visually recognizing the most common objects. He was making, what, when he was talking about objects, he was making semantic errors, <coughs> naming items as something that was similar in, similar in meaning. And he was also um, getting stuck so that a pen Having seen a pen, it might be called, he might call it um, a book, and then the next thing he saw would also be a book, even if it wasn't anything related. So he made these sort of strange meaning-related er errors and perseverative responses. Now, this wasn't down to being blind. Lissa noted that he was able to copy simple drawings and match simple shapes. And in these days before neuropsychology and tools such as the visual object and spatial perception battery, he got him to match patterns that were on the, that are stamped on the back of books to see whether he could see that the, these patterns were the same or different. And he could do this. And Lissa argued that Gottlieb could perceive many things without comprehending them. He had, was able to apperceive objects, but he did not recognize them. Now, this, this, this description of Gottlieb became rarefied in the literature into a distinction between two types of agnosia. The idea that something that was intact in Gottlieb, apperception, and the deficit that Gottlieb had was association. Lissar simply argued that what was wrong with Gottlieb was a problem with associating visual content of apperception with its various associated conceptual recollections. Um, in current terminology, we'd probably want to call that semantic analysis. Apperception, although the term apperceptive agnosia, you'll find it in every textbook of neuropsychology, apperceptive ag apperception is a concept which is quite foreign to most current cognitive models of the perceptual process. It's in fact a, a philosophical um, construct rather similar to attention, consciousness, awareness. It's the notion of the seizing by consciousness of sensory impressions. It, doesn't, it hasn't got anything really to say about perception per se, except to say that it happens. But I'm not going to go into too much detail about apperception. Um, we now know that what we would call the perceptual stage or the sensory analysis of visual Im information is fractionated into multiple subcomponents. We get this from neuroimaging as well as from patient work. Um, we can distinguish sensory processes where we can extract information. And there are separate channels for dealing with form, shape recognition, color, 
texture, size, a whole range of different sensory processes that are carried out in early visual um, visual system, early in the visual system, V1, um, V2. Then we go on to the next stage where we actually, the human visual system seems to be cleaning up, cleaning up dirty images, dealing with getting rid of the um, noise in a stimulus, um, and the kind of things that are going on at this level, combining parts and features, into, and features so being able to deal with fragmentation, uh, low light, shadows, and things like that. Dealing with volumetric processes, being able to extract the axis from a foreshortened object, um, being able to recognize an object as being the same despite different viewpoints, being able to cope with occlusion. A whole range of different stages in perceptual analysis. All of these would now be, uh, would sort of fall under the rubric of what Lissa called apperceptive. And these stages are arguably intact in patients who, some patients who've lost the ability to extract meaning from visual objects. Now, the visual associative agnosias, and these are the patients I'm going to be telling you about, have a modality-specific impairment of recognition. That is that their deficit in recognizing an object is disproportionate for the visual channel. There's also some cases who've got an auditory agnosia, sparing vision and sparing speech, so people will not be able to recognize this, a characteristic sound, understand the meaning of a sound. So a telephone ringing won't be particularly meaningful to them, or they'll confuse it with something else. Um, but there's also tactile um, agnosia, patients who simply can't recognize objects by touch. And there may be others, I don't know, but those are the ones that are most studied. Um, the key thing is that sensory processing appears to be intact in these patients. Hence the claim that this problem is one beyond the level of sensation. <coughs> We'd also say the patients I'm going to be describing, um, we would th I think that they've probably also got adequate perceptual analysis and that the structural information that they've extracted from the stimulus they're looking at is good enough for them to be able to do all the necessary work to be able to see a coherent structure. And the problem is one at the level of knowledge and that leads on to a problem with naming. So critically, it's not just a problem with finding the word to label something. To use a, a label, a term that was uh, introduced by uh, Hans Lucas Teuber, they've got a percept, but it's a percept that has been stripped of its meaning. Now, this is a sort of a little bubble, bubble diagram, not boxing diagrams, a bubble diagram. We can think of what's going on um, in visual object recognition. We've got a stage where we've got to do the sensory analysis of the stimulus. And th that's what I'm arguing is intact. Patients also um, have got optional stage of having to clean up a dirty image and make it um, something that they can work on. And then we come into a stage where I'm calling a visual thesaurus, where we can establish equivalence and synonymy um, amongst objects. And that's what I think is going wrong in patients with associative agnosia. Um, and that is a stage which is a precursor to getting into the more detailed um, action, emotion, semantic knowledge stage of knowing about an object. Now, the first patient I described back in many years ago, by the, and known by the initials of FRA, and this is a very, very early MRI scan before anyone did any functional MRI. This is a structural MRI. I think it's probably about a 1T. And this is the, um, this is the stroke that he suffered in the mostly it's affecting white matter, but also cortex in the left occipital lobe. His right occipital lobe and right hemisphere was thought to be intact. It was a focal um, posterior cortical artery infarction. And he had particular problems with naming things. But then when we went on to ask him to tell us about the things that he couldn't name, um, we found that if he saw pictures, he was making mistakes. He was making semantic approximations, calling a, you know, a, a pen might be called a, a stapler, for example. A cat might be called um, a horse, making these sort of semantic approximations or saying, I don't know what it is. However, if he was asked, what is a cat, what is a horse, absolutely no problem, 100% in ability to define them. 
we used two sets of, of stimuli with this, with him, and it just replicated quite easily across the two sets of stimuli. He could tell us all about the, the item when he heard the name of it, but when he saw the picture, he was coming up with semantic approximations and saying, I don't know. So what's going on? The classic test for um, looking at um, agnosia is to see what, how much, we want to know how much their apperception, their perceptual and sensory processing is intact. Um, now, this chap had problems with naming letters. Only through, but mostly through vision. So you could only name 12 letters for out of the alphabet by, from vision. But then he was exploring them by touch without vision. He could actually identify 20 out of 26. That's pretty good um, for somebody who's just had a stroke. Um, he couldn't visually match letters, uh, upper and lower case, scoring 10 out of 20, which is around chance. Um, but he had sparing of his ability to name numerals. He was completely dyslexic. On the simplest reading test that we've got, the Chanel color word test, he, was, he, got, he couldn't read them. So he's got, a, he's got a, a marked dyslexia and letter anomia. In fact, he's got a letter agnosia. Interesting, sparing his ability to recognize numbers. Now, he was tested on a range of sensory processing tests that were, have been, this was a patient I actually wrote up with uh, Elizabeth Warrington and using an early version of the visual object spatial perception battery, task here is to detect when there's an X present in the noise <coughs> versus just a noise stimulus. And he could do this. He could also discriminate um, squares and rectangles when they were matched for their overall flux, the so-called Ephron shapes test. That was intact. And then the other thing, we, we gave him some overlapping figures, so-called Poppelreuter test. And the problem with trying to establish whether he could actually see these things or clean up the dirty images, um, very difficult with somebody who can't name them. So we gave him some colored pens and said, color in the objects. And he was able to segment the individual objects satisfactorily, even when there was, there were sort of, there was quite clear occlusion that might help make him parse it into different ways. This is a test that actually breaks down in patients who've got the sort of integrative agnosia syndrome associated with right parietal and right, ox right occipital injuries. Um, so he's able to um, segment these stimuli, even though he's unable to tell us very much about them verbally. And he was unable to match them to their functions. So that if we asked him, tell us which one of these things would you use for boiling water, he would not be able, he was impaired at doing that as well. So we formally documented this using um, a test that's since been, it's available free on the internet, thanks to um, Seb Crutch and Elizabeth on the, um, on the UCL website, the DRC website, um, which is a test looking at probe knowledge for objects, animals, via vision and via, um, via words. And the patient is presented with a trio of items so three animals, and simply asked which of these would be the largest thing in real life. Same is said about objects, except the word used there is which of these is the heaviest thing in real life. And after they've gone through picking out the heaviest thing, you can go back and ask them which of these would be the lightest thing, the smallest thing in real life. And again, for the objects, do the same thing. You can do this for the visual objects, or you can present this the, as we did with FRA, which of these is the largest, the mouse, the rabbit, or the fox. Which of these is the heaviest, the bicycle, the deck chair, or an armchair? And the results were quite clear cut. He could do the task for um, when the, the in information was spoken. I think he made one mistake. Um, and, but when the material was presented visually, he really had significant difficulties. So he's unable to get to the... Um, to the, the size of the items, he's unable to get associative knowledge from the visual in information that he's looking at. We then went on to do what I think is the fundamental uh, problem in these patients, and that is he, getting him to judge what I call visual synonymy. So um, let's see if I've got a better... You know, I've skipped that, so it's gone further down. I'll come back and show you this later. Um, 
So one of the things we asked him, we showed him some other images and asked him whether he was looking at an, a picture of an animal or a bird. And he's actually making mistakes at this relatively low level, um, as a very abstract, very fundamental level of semantic judgment. He's making mistakes judging whether he's looking at an animal or a bird and scoring at a similar level when he's judging whether he's looking at an English animal or, and, or a dangerous animal. So just, just above chance on, on making those sort of distinctions. And another judgment of the largest and smallest, again, perfect on the auditory presentation, um, but much, much greater difficulty with visual presentation. So there's a big deficit there in judging uh, and extracting visual information. So the other thing that he was unable to do, and I'll just anticipate, I've got some pictures further on in the presentation. If we showed him two versions of the same thing, so two pictures of a rabbit, for example, um, and giving a distractor item, which might be um, a fox, asking him which of these two things is the same, or which of them are different, he was unable to make, do that matching task much above chance. So he's unable to do that sort of visual, visual matching. It's equivalent to judging whether an uppercase G and a lowercase g are the same letter. But so, the, uh, so letter synonyms, he can't do that. He also can't do object synonyms. So the argument that we made at this time was that what was going on with in this, we had a visual, uh, he has a visual associative agnosia. It's not, it's a modality specific problem. It's not affecting his verbal knowledge. And it's affecting something that's at a level that's higher than just purely being able to extract perceptual or structural information. Um, and maybe it's at a stage of semantic knowledge, or what I've argued is representing equivalence or synonymy for visual stimuli. What we don't know, when somebody can't tell you whether something is um, English or dangerous, does that mean they've damaged that encyclopedic knowledge of that stimulus through the visual channel? Is that somehow linked to the visual, visual, visual object? Or is it a gateway to some higher order encyclopedic representation that's been damaged? But we don't, we don't know whether these are separate or the same, same level of processing. What we do know is that what's going wrong is something that's more than perceptual or structural information processing, because that's intact. But we know that this is damaged. We also know that it's a modality specific problem because the patient can do these tasks when he hears the spoken name of the object. So the problem with in, in this agno, in ag, visual associative agnosia is at the level of finding equivalence for these various ver, visual instantiations of what we might call the same object, with this level of structural processing arguably being intact. Um, I'm going to go on and tell you about two other patients. Oh, we've got the wrong version of this talk up here, actually. That's why I'm getting a bit stuck. Um, two other patients who show this um, syndrome. Um, PhD, who's um, a, a left-handed man who sustained a closed head injury back in, um, back in, the, in sort of about 19, 1979, 1980. So he's a long-standing patient. Um, who has a prosopagnosia, but he's also got a category specific visual agnosia, particularly affecting living things. Now, I'm just going to jump down. This is an MRI scan, a structural MRI of um, PhD's brain. And you can see that the one area that's come out as, that's actually shown as persisting damage as a result of this injury is in the ventral surface temporo-occipital, sort of undersurface of the temporal lobe, quite far back here. You can see that. Um, and that's where his injury was. He has got other injuries as well, which don't show up so well. He's got a little bit of gliosis in the frontal lobes as well. But um, the key injury seems to be this one in his left temporo-occipital region. Now, he's able to pass Sensory processing test, he can do this same, the same level as um, FRA, passing these kinds of tests and failing this kind of test. As I've got the wrong version of this talk up, I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit, and I'll tell you a little bit about DRS as well. 
and deal with these in parallel. Uh, DRS is a gentleman, we haven't got a scan for him. He actually is a man with multiple uh, cerebrovascular um, insults who became agnosic and dyslexic following, a, again, a left posterior artery um, occlusive stroke resulting in an occipital, occipitotemporal lesion. But he also had damage on the other side of the brain on, in his right hemisphere as well. And he's a very able chap. He was actually a, a scientist um, with his verbal IQ well above the, well into the, super, into, the, into the superior range at least, and whereas PhD is just at the, at the bottom of the average range. But his performance IQ was very poor because he had real difficulty doing the visual object recognition components of the task. And he also had some spatial difficulties. So he was really not good on performance IQ. Um, PhD is also poor on the performance IQ. Primarily, in both cases, a lot of this was down to difficulties with the picture completion task. They really made, had a, had, didn't get on with that at all. Both patients were able to do this sensory processing task. And both were able to do um, an object decision task in which they were asked to pick out the real object from amongst an array of four. This is a subtest of the VOSP. <coughs> Going on to um, defining pictures and words, this is PhD. This is the, the gentleman who had the, uh, the head injury. And he shows particular problems in telling us about visual pictures of animals. He's also having a bit of difficulty with fruit and vegetables, but not as significantly. And his objects are nearly perfect from, from pictures. In the case of words, he's also got a bit of blunting, significant blunting on animals and fruit and vegetables, but his objects are intact. In this case, we're looking at a relative deficit with disproportionate problems with visual representations of um, objects. I'm going to show you from DRS. He's got a problem with recognizing objects, sparing his ability to recognize animals. And after I've shown this video, I'm going to get back and try and get onto the older copy of, this, of, the, of the PowerPoints, if I might, the other copy, because I'm, otherwise I'm going to get completely into a tangle. Um, and what DRS was able to do, he was able to show us a good pantomime of how you would use an object. So ask him to show us how, tell us how you would use a hammer, and he was able to give us a good pantomime for how to use a hammer. How would you use a plane? He was able to give a good demonstration of this. A screwdriver, he could do that. Scissors, he could give you all of those pantomimes to the words very nicely and fluently. However, shown the objects, he made abundant semantic errors. So shown a pair of scissors, he pantomimed doing a twisting motion that would be appropriate for a screwdriver. Shown a hammer, he did a, a waving motion as if he was using something like a plane. So he was getting semantic confusions in his gestures, but he was able to produce the same gesture when, when the word was spoken. And here's a video clip of DRS. Oops, come back, come back. Um, if I can get to it. Which is most like. Which is the same sort of thing, has the same sort of function. Oh, function. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so he actually got there eventually, but you can see that it's really hard work for him to actually do that visual synonymy task, and he's using he's often using surface properties, so he's he's gone for the the opaque one eventually there, as his, in order to judge which is equivalent. So going back to um, to to the other person, the man who had the head injury now. This is um, Nichols' PhD. He's able to do object decision, pick out the real object from amongst things like this at a satisfactory level. He was also able to, to judge which of these um, was the real object when just shown um, a silhouette, pick out which are the real objects and which are the invented objects. But he couldn't do that for the animals. So he was able to do the, anim the object chimeras, in the, but he couldn't do the animal chimeras using the shape. So he's having a problem there. That's his drawing from memory. He could draw a hammer. It's a reasonable rendition of a claw hammer, I think, from memory. But his recollection of an elephant, it took a long time for him to draw it. He knew, that, he knew verbally that an elephant was a large animal with tusks. And he, after a lot of debate, um, he started off putting tusks at the top of the head, but eventually put them at the front. But he completely forgot about the trunk. So that's his drawing of an animal. And this is his def defining pictures and words. I've showed this to you sh uh, a little while ago, that he's actually much worse with pictures than with words, disproportionately so for animals. Um, the other task that we tried was giving what we call a delayed copy task, where he's actually shown real objects or chimeric objects and shown real anim animals or um, chimeric animals. And that's got out of step two. Um, that's just to remind us that he's actually, he, could, he was very, very good at naming animals and telling us about animals when he heard their sounds. So the characteristic sound of an elephant, he could tell us all about an elephant. But looking at an elephant, unless he was given sufficient time to work out that it was a large grey animal with something sticking out of the front of its head, and therefore it was more likely to be an elephant than to, than to be a seal, um, he was having difficulty. He could, had no problem identifying the sound an elephant makes. Um, we went on to do a very, an early functional imaging study, which unfortunately has never been published, um, because various people went to different parts of the world shortly after the study was completed. Um, and this is the basic, um, it's, a, it's, an event, it's not an event related, it's a, a block paradigm, where he was looking either at blocks of animals, pictures of animals, or blocks of pictures of objects. And his task was to detect the presence or absence of a little blue square at the background, rather than actually do anything with the stimulus in front of him. And this was the results of the, of the scan. These are the controls on the, on the left. And here's the, um, the signal. With a signal in P this is PhD scans, and there's arguably a drop in his uh, response in the left occipital area here, 
and it's slightly less marked there, but they actually did some proper statistics on it. And we get living versus fixation. That, so that was the, an, the objects, which wasn't too bad. But when we look at the animals, we can see that there's actually very, very little activity by comparison with the controls are showing a very similar pattern to when they're looking at the objects. So the, an, the, ob, the controls are showing a similar pattern with objects and animals, whereas um, PhD is showing a very different pattern when he's looking at animals. And this is a subtractive analysis looking at the controls as sim versus living minus objects. And we can see that PhD has a deficit so this is picking out on the specific activity due to animals is really is, is the blue area here is showing deficit. What is interesting in lighting up and showing an advantage, extra hyper, more perfusion is in the frontal lobes, as if his brain is sort of saying, what on earth is this I'm looking at and trying to work out the trying to work it out. So his frontal lobe is working there. And that's these are the um, the other showing the scans from the from another angle is showing that again there's this relative deficit in his processing of, of the animals. And living minus objects, again, it's showing the same thing with posterior cortical hypoactivity, but slightly enhanced activity in the frontal lobes. So PhD shows this deficit in his um, processing <coughs> of sorry, objects of animals sparing his ability to recognize objects. Now, the literature shows that difficulties with recognizing animals is, in fact, a co relatively common observation. In the world of disorders of object and word recognition, these being relatively rare disorders generally, but amongst that relatively rare and uncommon bunch of patients, those who've got a disproportionate difficulty with recognizing animals are, and certainly in the literature, the, the vast bulk of patients who've been reported. And the reasons for this have been speculative. It might be neuroanatomy. It may be that the areas involved in animal and living thing recognition are just those who somehow seem to be more vulnerable to the effects of stroke or tumors or I don't know. The other possibility is that it's a psychological problem. It's because there's a task difficulty. It's down to the frequency, familiarity, or the visual confusability of the stimuli. Now, that's one explanation, perhaps, for PhD. A man with a head injury, you assume there's going to be a reasonable amount of quite diffuse injury, as well as the focal pictures that we can see. But seeing somebody with a selective impairment of object recognition, a double dissociation, makes this explanation slightly less strong and makes you think that there may be something in the selective impairment of his animal processing. And this is DRS, who shows the associative agnosia for objects. So this is the summary. Again, he was a 59-year-old uh, scientist who got, who'd had several small strokes. Um, but he was intellectually intact. His, he was able to de define words, give similarities, cal do calculations, etc., very well. And his verbal memory and his nonverbal memory, note he's able to recognize faces on the um, Warrington recognition memory test for faces at, an, at a normal level. These are just both within the average range. And he can do this kind of task. He can do this kind of task, pick out the real object. But he failed pantomime when he's shown the object. And he also fails doing a visual, visual matching task. This is something we've tested both uh, PhD and DRS on this. So here's his show. So it's a, it's a, this is sort of a, a slightly more, a different version of the visual matching task that you saw the, on the video. So I've shown a picture here of some keys and given this array here and simply asked, find me another one that's like this in this array. And on this task, DRS only got 50, 45%, less than half of these correct. PhD, the chap who can't do animals, was 90% correct on this task. The opposite pattern was seen with animals, shown, try to find me another one of these, and DRS was 85% correct. PhD was 50% uh, was correct. These results were, are significant when we do the actual stats, given the numbers of items that we used. 
So DRS has particular problems with visual-visual matching of objects. It's mostly small manipulable objects. He was better when he was dealing with um, vehicles, items of transport, and he was about the same as items of transport when he was matching pictures of, um, pictures of animals. Asked to point to the named thing, there's an interesting facilitation. So when he's asked to point to the picture of the cow, he's actually better than when he's asked to find another cow, just shown two pictures to do it. So he can actually match visually to a name better than he can match visually to another picture. Um, but there's this, there is this disproportionate problem in recognizing visual objects as opposed to animals, which by all accounts should be the more difficult item. So, to very briefly summarize what we've seen, we've got what we call a category by modality effect. These patients show modality specific disorders that are disproportionate for the visual channel relative to the spoken name. So it's, the problem is not simply one at the level of a visual sensory analysis of the stimuli that they're looking at. They're able to perform tests such as shape discrimination, texture segregation, matching, uh, finding the, the real object from amongst um, structurally confusing silhouettes at a normal level. They've got a problem that's post-sensory, and it's arguably also post-perceptual. It's also affecting two different uh, domains of meaning. One patient is worse with animals, the other is worse with objects. Now, what's going on here? Are they, are they, have we damaged the actual semantic representations? Or are we looking at some artifact due to visual complexity? Well, I think that becomes quite unlikely when we've got a double dissociation with one patient being worse with one class of things and another patient being worse with another class. Is it something to do with the fact that two different views of an animal are somehow more similar to each other than two different, two different types of cup? That, again, seems a bit unlikely, given that we've got the double dissociation. Although animals, I think, my instinct is that animals are somehow easier because they do look much more, you know, two views of a cow. It's very difficult to get two completely different cows unless you've just, got, just going by colour. Their forms are very similar. That's part of the ways of the animals are, this is the structural similarities of animals. It's part of the fact that makes them easy, but it also makes them quite difficult to distinguish between each other. Is the problem, however, something what we might call associative in the sense that Lissau said, is it a problem with extracting meaning from an object, or is it linking that in visual information to a finding an appropriate sort of representation that we can then use to get through to um, higher order representations of action, emotion, etc. So one way of looking at what's going on here is that we're looking at a what I call a quadrant, of, a quadrant effect. We've got a category specific visual agnosia, selective impairment of one visual category sparing a verbal knowledge. Um, and we've already, there's a, there's, there is a fair amount of evidence out there now that we can get exactly the same pattern in the verbal domain. Patients who are disproportionately bad at knowing either animals from, the verb, from words, sparing their visual knowledge of animals, versus patients who are disproportionately bad at knowing about the verbal knowledge of objects with relative sparing of, of visual knowledge of objects. So we get this double dissociation in the verbal domain. We also get it in the visual. So it's a semantic, it's what I call a semantic quadrant agnosia. So we've got both animals um, and can be affected visually or verbally, and objects can be, a, 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 can be affected visually or verbally. We may also find that people can be disproportionately affected either through visual knowledge, prosopagnosia, or verbal knowledge, name agnosia. That's, very, that's quite strongly documented in the, in the uh, semantic dementias, or reasonably well documented anyway. Um, so I think what we've got is good evidence, at the very least, for saying that in visual associative agnosia, we've got a breakdown of representation, at least at the level of the visual synonyms, equivalences. <coughs> um, <coughs> 
so that and that those if we if you agree with me on that point it means that that thesaurus of object synonyms or stimulus synonyms is itself subdivided into being able to deal with different forms of animals and different forms of objects they're not all the same thing and then people's faces may be separate again these are separate from the ability to assign structural uh, equivalence to the same object if from different viewpoints and at different levels of occlusion. I think, having mentioned people and faces, I think it may be helpful to develop a model along the lines that's been put forward by Burton and Bruce for um, face recognition, the, the, their interactive act, uh, activation um, model of face recognition, where, in fact, what we've got... Uh, we've, got, it's, we've got to be able to decide visual, visual synonyms, the vis, visual object recognition, the pin, not the pins, but visual synonyms. Providing input to a modality input independent gateway and then into semantic information. That semantic information may be shared polymodally. It's not, not sort of, we're not, when you look at an object, you're not immediately extracting all of the semantic associations and content that goes along with that object. Looking at a pyramid, you, you may recognize it as an exemplar of a pyramid. You won't necessarily, by looking at it, be, have bundled with that the same information that tells you all about um, pharaohs and Tutankhamun and all of the other facts that you happen to have learned. That we, but in fact, we've got to get to some visual equivalence level, and this is what's gone wrong in associative agnosic patients. Finally, I think we can... Work, thinking more about these sort of patients, it enables us to go a bit beyond a simple dichotomy of apperceptive versus associative agnosia. Um, within apperception, we now know, as I said at the beginning, we've got evidence for vast arrays of subsystems, sensory processing of, of, of colour, form, texture, etc., structural processing, integrative processing, lots of different things going on here. It seems silly to think that visual object recognition, the higher level, will be, uh, be any less complex than that. We've got to think about, as I say, my argument is that these patients have got a problem with visual synonymy. But then, how on earth do we deal with things like beliefs? How do we know how to behave when we go into a particular type of bedroom, for example, that's decorated pink and frilly? We know that that's one sort of bedroom, whereas you go into one with clothes thrown, thrown all over the place and a computer. You, you behave in a different way in the two different settings. <coughs> That is a visual type of information that you're extracting from a scene. That's another type of um, visual recognition and can also be disordered in some patients. Um, preliminary evidence. Um, anecdotally, anecdotally um, I worked recently with a lady who actually has got right temporal variant semantic dementia. And the, one of the presenting problems was she didn't know how to behave when she went into her daughter's house. She normally she'd have gone in and taken off her shoes and relaxed and sat down and be absolutely fine, know how to do it. But she went in there and she just didn't know. She didn't know how she should behave. So that, that, that stimulus no longer had the associations of the higher order representations. Didn't have problems with, uh, with um, recognizing objects, um, but she just didn't know how to behave in a particular setting. We also worked some years ago with another patient who was able to name objects um, but he seemed to have lost higher order associations. So he, although he could name a camel, when asked, can you tell us something about this thing? He told us it was found in cold places and it was a dangerous beast. Um, he simply didn't have the higher order knowledge that, was, that we would normally associate with those things. So I think these are all, it's a, there's a lot to learn still about uh, levels of object meaning, object representation. And I hope I've just given you a flavour of some of the things that we could actually learn by working with patients who sadly have deficits in these areas. Thank you very much.